Hello, my name is Wesley Wallace, and today for Radford University's Tartan newspaper, I'll be interviewing Dr. Thomas Duncan, uh, an assistant economics professor at Radford University. How are you today? I'm doing okay. Uh, it is associate professor, though. Just so associate you know. professor. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, uh, given your economic experience, um, you've had experience teaching macroeconomics at the university, um, basically get your thoughts on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the U.S. economy. Um, as the coronavirus outbreak continues to spread across the globe, there are approximately 22,460,293 cases of COVID-19 worldwide. Um, when it pertains to the United States, there are 5,532,566 cases of coronavirus in our country, uh, leading up to 170,241 deaths, according to the John Hopkins School of Medicine. The virus has caused the United States to be in one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Um, the unemployment rate in the United States is stood at 11.1% as of June, um, while this marked an improvement from the 14.7% of the jobless rate in April. Um, it is still higher than at any than at any time in the last 70 years. I'm going to ask you, given this information, where do you see the U.S. economy heading in the near future, and how will the economy be, re be repaired if cases continue to increase so uh, obviously it's it's not good news right mm -hmm. uh, it, it is at least somewhat promising that it seems that the unemployment rate is is starting to fall so it's moving in the right direction but not very quickly and there was a little bit of a spike in the jobs report um, very recently, the, the weekly report showed that it bounced back up a little bit. So that's a little concerning is, um, is, is what that's gonna hold out to do. And at least uh, at part of it's gonna depend on what, what happens with the virus and what happens in the policy response to the virus, right? Those are the, those are the two big things. So the virus makes people stay home. It can make people spend, their spending patterns work in different ways. Um, and, and we can talk more about that when we, when we get to some of the, how do college students respond to, to stuff. But, but it's, it's what I'll say for now, right, is it's not hitting the economy evenly, right? Like it's hitting it. And so people that could move, move home and work remotely, I won't say they came through unscathed, right? No one came through unscathed, but they were mm -hmm. able to compensate for that. But bars and restaurants got, got hammered with this. And some of the restaurants have actually come out better than you would think because they were able to move to delivery or, or curbside pickup. But the workers, right, you didn't need, you didn't need to have wait, waitresses and waiters, right? You didn't need wait staff because you couldn't right. get in. And so that is that has really hurt a lot of that. Um, you've got some people who are, are taking leaves um, Right, so you have like the processing plants that have shut down because they had a virus spike. Uh, and so people just couldn't go to work because they had to quarantine for a certain amount of period. Um, and so you've gotten some of those that have really hit the economy. And so that's like the virus, so some of that's the virus side. And some of that is the policy response where people were told you can't go to work, you're not allowed to go to work. Um, and that was, there are pros and cons to that, right? So yeah, she sent people home where, where maybe they're safer. Um, how much safer is really debatable on that. Um, there are a lot of, what we're seeing now, right, is is there in the isolation periods there, there were a lot of um, mental strains, mental stresses, alcoholism on the rise, suicides on the rise, things, think drug, drug related things on the rise. And so there are negatives associated with that, but the unemployment rate is is one of those. And so if you're thinking about what it looks like in the future, it's gonna be a combination of what's happening with the virus and what's happening with the policy response because places that had more stringent responses to the policy saw higher unemployment rates, um, which makes sense, right? Like if more people are told they can't work, you have more people that aren't working. Right. Um, so it shouldn't be shocking that that's a correlation with what we see. And a lot of that happened initially in urban areas. And so it looked really bad um, it was really bad, but it looked really bad because urban areas have higher population counts. And so when you lock down New York City, you spike the unemployment rate higher than if you like lock down Radford. Right. Um, just because there's more, more people there. Um, 
and now it's kind of moving through the south. The virus is moving through the south and it's moving through the Midwest that was less hit early on. And so it'll depend, one, it does look, at least on the surface, like maybe we have a better handle on how to treat the, the virus. Obviously there's no cure for it, but maybe if we can drive the death rate down, it's, 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 it's not gonna not be a big deal, but maybe the policy response aspect will, can be more muted if, if we know how to treat it a little bit better, but the hospitals are better prepared. Um, and they're not being caught off guard this time. They've had a little bit of time to prepare. And so if, if that's true and, and, and we're better prepared for it, there might be less of a hit. It'll still be a hit as it ripples through, mm -hmm. but we might see a less of a pressure. And so maybe we won't spike back up to that really dramatic. Um, I mean, we hit some, really high records right in like April. So right. maybe we won't spike back up to April in terms of the unemployment rate. But I think it's it's way easier to, it's way faster to see an economy break than it is to see it recover. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're probably going to have some high unemployment linger for a while. And certainly some industries are still not back fully functional, right? Bars and restaurants still have only 25% capacity or 50% capacity, depending on where you are. Um, and so we, they're going to be running, operating at a much slower rate. People are still fearful. Uh, fear in an economy can do a lot of damage in terms of unemployment and things. And I mean, it's not unjustified fear, but it's the fear that right, I, I haven't really, I, I've been out to a restaurant once for a wedding where we sat far apart from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, um, and I, I'm a pretty... I'm not that risk averse, right? Like I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm risk seeking, but I'm not super risk averse, but like I'm not out there doing things either. So people that are more risk averse are gonna be staying home, not going to restaurants and, and not doing things. And so it's gonna take a long time for people to recover there. If we get a vaccine and it's effective and it's functional, we might get a quick recovery once that period is there. But think about that, right? Like that's not even projected until sometime next year. Right. Uh, to, to be to be viable. And so I think we're going to deal with a very sluggish, very slow economy, if for no other reason, because people are fearful. Um, people, and, and again, not, not everyone has the same risk profile. Some people are perfectly fine rolling out. Some people may have had the virus and now they're like, look, I, I think we're fine, which there's some evidence, maybe that's true. There's some evidence, maybe that's not true. So, um, and so some, some people are going to move back to work faster and some people just can't stay home right like they can't stay home um even even in terms of like going out and doing economic activity some some people's home lives are not going to let them stay at home because it's awful there right, right. so they're going to be out doing some stuff um but that that's not going to be even and it's going to be slow and it's going to be kind of sluggish until until either the virus dissipates right either it's either it dissipates naturally if that's what happens or it dissipates because we've got a handle on it and because we we have some vaccines and or we come up with you know better better treatments maybe again I'm not a medical professional right so um, maybe we come up with better treatments where where you can get over it much faster um, and I know people are working on different aspects I think the main focus now has been on testing and vaccine but I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, hospitals are discovering a lot about how to treat it, how to, how to not treat it, right? They've made some mistakes. Um, but I think as we see those kinds of issues begin to plane out, we'll start to see some recoveries, but it's, it, there were areas that were hard hit and some of those areas, uh, so if you think about areas that really didn't have much room to give when it happened, some businesses that shut down for this length of time aren't going to come back. Right. right. Like they didn't have the money to come back. Um, and that was probably true as early as, to be honest, March. Some of those businesses were done. Um, and so some of them that are like, yep, we're just waiting for it to get better are going to find out that it's not going to get better for them. Um, and so I, I have actually been, from a local perspective, I've actually been somewhat impressed with Radford's ability to survive. Uh, I had a lot of fear. Uh, about Radford City's downtown area because it's kind of tenuous 
in normal times. Right. Um, but a lot of people in the community stepped up, right? Like a lot of people were still buying from the restaurants and trying to keep the lifeblood going. And uh, I think to companies like the Super Game Station down there, he converted his entire inventory to online to be able to, to sell things. I mean, people were pretty, pretty clever. And I think a lot of locals went out of their way to try to support those downtown businesses, which hopefully is happening in lots of towns. But um, again, some some businesses just did not have room and and that unemployment will last longer and take longer as they have to reconvert their entire lives um right if you owned a business now you don't and all your employees are unemployed they have to find new jobs you have to turn that over and that that's going to take some time it'll take time for people to realize that's what they need to do uh and it'll take some time for them to do it once they realize that's what they need to do in addition to the pandemic hurting the national economy in our country, it's also had a really a big impact on the higher education system in our country. Uh, just the other day, Notre Dame uh, converted to all online classes. Um, I know some schools are completely going virtual this year. Um, it's even impacted Radford University. I know some departments have gone through budget cuts. Um, some faculty are adjusting to new positions, whether doing hybrid classes or online learning. Um, since coming back to the university, what has that experience been like for you? And what has your experience been like seeing that impact on Radford's educational system? Stressful, very stressful. Um, I know that there's a lot of support groups for faculty also, and that that sounds like, I mean, students are struggling with it more, like we still get paid, right? So um, so I know that students are struggling with it more, but it is a strain on the, on the faculty, just the number of things to keep track of right now. Um, so, I mean, for my classes, right, like I am teaching in a classroom face-to-face. -face. There was a decision about do we do, to do that, to not to do that, because we could have filed with HR to, to say, you know, we have a, a reason that we're, we would prefer to be online. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, for, for some of our like older faculty, right, you, you don't want to be in a classroom. Right. Um, you know, there's, the virus certainly has an age, like it hits certain ages more, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so for some of our faculty, right, like even though they love the students and they love being in a classroom, right, that's a stressful situation to, to make decisions about that. Um, our, our teams, our technology teams actually did really well to get our room set up. So when I'm teaching in class, I'm face to face, I'm zooming out. I'm also recording the lectures. Um, and it's not, it's not ideal. It's not as clean as if we were just a face to face class. There's a lot more to kind of keep track of. And I know I'm not the only one like, you know, you forget to turn the recording on or you forget to share a screen and zoom when you're, and you're doing things. So it's more stuff to like keep track of in your classroom, just technologically. Um, and you're bouncing back and forth and you're like trying to do things on like your whiteboard or your dot cam and then you got to go back to PowerPoint and then you go and, and it's just it's a lot of stuff keeping keeping going. But so far, the the, the students who are who are attending have been engaged and they've been pretty understanding about that lots of stuff's going on. Right. And that's right. a two way street. Right. Like faculty are trying to be understanding and students are trying to be understanding. Um, and at least in my classes, I've had a, everyone in, in my classes is like keeping their mask on and doing the things that they're supposed to do. And I've been really impressed with that. I, I didn't expect them not to, but you know, there's always the chance that that might, might yeah. be the case. And so students have been just, they're taking it seriously and they're concerned and we get the notification saying, you know, I, I got, I don't feel good today and I went to get a test and so I'm, I'm not going to come to class today and I'm going to do it by Zoom and, and stuff. And so it seems like, and, and I know there are news reports out there about different stuff, right? But, but at least my experiences seem to be that, that students are, are taking it seriously, uh, at least those that I'm directly engaging with. Mm -hmm. And they're following the university protocols. Um, and I mean, there, there's a lot of protocols. I mean, I, I know you as a student, me as a faculty, I mean, we got like dozens of emails a week about things yeah. over the summer. So it's, it takes a little bit to figure out what, what the rules of the game are, right? Because they're so, they're so different and there's so many of them. Um, and they're emerging in the situation. I was shocked at Notre Dame. Now, I didn't look to see what their numbers looked like when they did that, but they were one of the first ones to say they were going to be face-to-face. -face. Yeah. And then they, they went quick back in the other direction. UNC was pretty strong on the, we're going to be face-to-face, -face, and seven days was all it took for them. 
Um, but I, I think, um, I don't know what the future of Radford's going to hold there. That, thank God I don't have to make that decision. Um, I don't know what the future is going to hold there, but it, it looks at least initially like maybe what we have is manageable. And I want to be careful with the language there, right? Because saying manageable in a serious situation sound, makes it sound like you don't care about the negatives. But mm -hmm. it, it does look like it's while we have some some negatives and downsides, right? It looks like we're hopefully not going the route of Notre Dame. Again, we, we, we won't know that for a few weeks yet. But, um, but I, I hope that, I mean, I, I know that I, I like teaching face-to-face. -face. Like when we moved online in the spring, uh, it's just, I've done online classes and stuff, but that was not ideal, right? Lots of students who didn't want to be online ended up, ended up online. Right. People who knew they weren't going to succeed online. That's why they weren't in an online class to start with. Um, and then the number of our students who, when they got kicked off campus, right, when, they, when it got shut down and they had to go home, they just don't have internet connection. Um, like, I was, I was at least mildly surprised at how many of our students don't have stable internet when they go back to their parents' house. And I thought about that. Like, if I moved back to the house that I grew up in, I wouldn't be able to teach there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's... Um, so it's 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 a challenge, and it's been and it's been an adjustment period for us. But it's nice seeing the students and and engaging with the students again. And we're only a, a week in. It's tiring. I wear a mask when I teach, and so basically I'm screaming for an hour and fifteen to make myself heard. Uh, the, I didn't realize how bad my lung power was until I had to do that. <laughs> Um, but just having to project and then when students answer right there's a lot of can you repeat your question because it was muffled so um, so it's 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 different but hopefully we're gonna make it work and hopefully this isn't the norm of how we just operate I mean I don't know what the rest of the fall and what the spring's gonna hold but hopefully by like next year we're back to a semblance of normal normal courses and earlier on in the interview, we kind of touched on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted restaurants and bars. Um, a majority of them, or a lot of them, are owned by small business owners. I know earlier last semester when we left for spring break due to the virus, there was a lot of, on the news, you heard a lot about a lot of small businesses applying for the Small Business Administration loans, uh, trying to get funding to, or some aid to fund their businesses through during that time. And mm -hmm. what a lot of times we also saw a lot of big corporations also applying for those loans as well, Shake Shack, um, Amazon. What did you, when you heard about the that? LA what, Lakers. Yeah, <laughs> what did you, what, what did you make of that? And for some people who may not know, how is it possible for some mega corporation to apply for those loans or that funding? It's about the definitions in that program in terms of, of small business. And so small business doesn't often mean what people think it means. And even in that program, they define small businesses in, in some ways that we don't typically think of small businesses. Um, and so at least for things like the, the LA Lakers, uh, that was one that I looked at. So I, like I, I have a working paper with some colleagues that actually touches on that, that subject. Um, and, and a lot of it was definitions and it's like, you know, under 500, people, employees can be one of the ways that you think of, that's not typically what we think of. Typically we think of 50 or smaller, mm -hmm. but under some definitions under 500 is considered small, you know, relative to like Amazon um, or, or some of those big ones. And so if you think about that and the mix of how many of these bigger organizations, like say a Lakers or, or and, and, and I don't know, I don't know everything about their organizational structure, but I do know that a lot of what they hire are contractors, right? Which aren't technically your employees. And right. so that can lower how many employees you're counting. And they did end up, by the way, give that, like that organization ended up giving the money back after it became like a big media issue. Now, they said we gave it back when it ran out of funding, but I, I would connect that probably with bad press more than, more than what was going on in the funding. But, uh, but there was, there were a lot of issues with that program and there was a, a whole lot of oversight issues with that program um, and some people some people were able to get under under the definitions that the that that were in place in the the bill that got passed um, and so they were able to kind of stretch themselves or shrink themselves to fit into that definition 
Um, and then there were some people that just took advantage of the fact that it was a whole lot of money flowing through an office that was unprepared to handle that amount of money. Um, and so there were some people that cheated that system. And I know there was a um, inspector general report that came out that they had some trouble getting data. The small business administration wasn't keeping track of the data or it wasn't providing it to the right oversight committees. And they had some problems getting that data out of there. In fact, if you go read that report, um, and I don't remember the exact date of that report, but if, if you send me an email later, I can actually send you that report. Mm -hmm. um, they actually in that report said, like we had a lot of, we worked with a lot of agencies through the CARES Act and some of them were really good. Some of them were really awful. And then they called the Small Business Administration out by name. Uh, they were like, we had special problems with the, the Paycheck Protection Program in the Small Business Administration. Um, and so some of that, some of that was, and I think the Lakers were one that were able to do it legally under the right definition, but some of them were, some of them just got through the gate when they weren't supposed to get through the gate. Um, and the program did, did run out of money. I know some small businesses that were able to, to get it. Um, and it was an interesting program, right? Because if you managed to maintain uh, I think it was if you took the loan and 75% of it, uh, I think was the number, 75% of it was used only for paychecks, it became a grant eventually, so you didn't have to pay back the loan. Um, and so some businesses who were able to do that and keep their employees going, right? Like if you fired employees during that, you got in trouble. Right. But if you were able to keep your employees going through that, you actually, like that, that actually... Issues aside, there are issues with that as an incentive problem, but it also probably saved some of those those businesses. Um, and so you do you do get some of those, but again, anytime there's that much money on the line, some people are gonna find creative ways to get access to it when maybe in an ideal situation they wouldn't they wouldn't be getting access. But it's so much money on the line there. Um, and some of them walked away with lots of money. <laughs> um, and a lot I don't of know if that directly answered your question or not. Absolutely, it did. And a lot of times, when we're, especially when we're going through this pandemic and we're talking about um, how this virus has impacted our country's economy, but economies around the world, oftentimes you often find an overlap between politics and financial funding or financial resources. I want to get your opinion on this as the Democratic and Republican parties continue to negotiate a deal for coronavirus stimulus aid. Um, President Trump disapproves of Democrats' decision to allocate $3.6 billion to help states run elections and $25 billion for postal service aid. Um, the mailing industry generates $1.58 trillion in sales revenue. 80% of mail industry jobs depend on the delivery infrastructure, uh, most of which is operated by the U.S. Postal Service. 18% um, of Americans pay their bills via the mail, including 40% of seniors, and nearly one in five Americans receive their tax refund through the mail. Why do you think there's such an overlap between political ideologies and economic decisions? And do you think the president's views toward the Postal Service will cause uh, harm to the country's economy and American lives through an economic perspective? Uh, so I actually don't know that much about the structure of the post office. I know that it's not, uh, it's not always like it, it has a lot of subsidies and if the subsidies weren't there, like a lot of times it's not going to make it. And so it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a government agency, right? It's not a for-profit business. Right. Um, uh, in terms of that, and I know that you were going to ask a question about, about Biden's economic plan too. And so I can really address at least what, what, I, what I will say about both of those things, which is we spent, we being the U.S., spent a ton of money through the coronavirus already, mm -hmm. um, right? So we we spent like a year's worth of spending in a month. Uh, in fact, probably more. fully about continuing to add to those levels of debt in the U.S. economy. Um, 
eventually um, you have to find some way of paying for that debt. And right now the Federal Reserve is, is helping with that by keeping interest rates super low, which lets which helps let the government borrow at super low interest rates or at least relatively low interest rates. Um, they're also doing some funky stuff with money to, to basically inflate away a little bit of that debt, which is very dangerous territory, right? That like once you start a process of doing that, um, I think one of the scariest things was that when the Fed made some statement, and this is paraphrasing it, that basically said, don't worry about the coronavirus spending, spend for this emergency and we'll, we'll help. That's terrifying for the Fed to say because we know what it looks like when your monetary agency uh, helps, right? That's where you get Venezuela. That's where you get uh, rounds of Argentina, of Brazil, and you, you can have a lot of currency crises with that. And all the world is spending right now. And so, so the way to think about international finance is that it's a, it's a relative thing. Because if you're thinking about where to put your money, um, you want to look at relative risk factors, right? So it's like, is it relatively safer to invest in the US or Europe or Russia or China or some of those places, right? And so you're thinking about that. And so everyone's kind of doing this. And so the US can spend more than it usually is without people starting to freak out about whether or not they'll pay back their debt mm -hmm. because it's still relatively safer. But relatively safer to Europe doing the same strategy is not relatively safer than the US last year. Right. Um, and so um, eventually the spending initiatives um, and the idea, right, the, the CARES Act took really, I mean, I know there were negotiations there, but their negotiations basically ended up with let's spend money on all the things. Um, and that was an emergency measure and it got through because things were really bad in April and when, when they were doing that negotiation and doing that, right? March and April were, were pretty bad times economically. And so they, they, they did too much of emergency stuff. Um, but now that the dust has kind of settled on that and while things are still bad, either side looking to just spend more money needs to think very carefully about where that money is going to come from. Right. Uh, Cause if you, if you have people get fearful and stop lending to the U.S., right? We have modern economies that have had this issue, right? Greece had this issue during the, the financial crisis, right? It popped their country. Mm -hmm. And they've been through rounds and rounds of, of austerity packages and bailouts from uh, the European Union and the European Central Bank and things. And they, and they never have really, they never did really fully recover from that because it takes a long, long time once your credibility is shot. Right. And the U.S. needs to think about that because we were not we were not in a super awesome financial position before. Right. We were not in a, necessarily a really terrible one, but we were not in a good one. Mm -hmm. um, our debt to GDP ratio was was pretty high. Right. We were sitting in the you know, we, we've been kind of running 70 percent. So if you don't count what government owes to itself, we were running around like in the 70 percent range and higher. And now we're we're much higher than that. Right. And so once you get to the 100 percent ratio, the way to get out of that is to either, you know, stop spending or to have GDP grow really quickly to mm -hmm. out, out compete your debt ratio. But it doesn't look like GDP is just going to shoot back up and start run away, right? Like we're going to have a lot less GDP. So it's, it's a danger to think that we can continuously spend in the way that we are continuously spending right now. Um, and again, that was true before this crisis, which is part of the reason why economists are like, don't spend as much when times are good, because you're going to have to do this, mm -hmm. or you're, you're going to be, politically, you're going to have to do this, right? Like, if no act had been passed in March and April, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, if no act had been passed, those congressmen were not getting reelected, right? Like, right. they were, like, if they didn't do something, they were not going to get reelected. But I think all the plans need to seriously account for how are they going to go about paying back what we've spent and any of their future spending that we're going to do. It's going to have to come from somewhere. Um, and, and there's only so much you can tax from people, right? I mean, like there's, there's only so much you're willing to do. France has discovered that, right? They, they once gave, they, they, so they tried like the billionaire tax and tried to tax like 75%. They, London got a bunch of new residents. Right, like they moved out of France and they, they moved. And so you have to be careful when you just expect that, yeah, we'll figure this out later. 
it actually is, is something that you should be planning before you do the spending right. as opposed to trying to figure it out after. Um, and so I think, so I think, and I, I, that doesn't pick directly on the post office, but it picks on, on basically the spending packages anyway, is to, we should start seriously thinking about how we're going to pay for all of this stuff. And you don't want to pay for it in inflation. The U S went through that in the seventies and eighties, like inflation started to run away. And there was an eight year recession because we stopped it. Right. Paul Volcker came back and from like, he went to London and they said, stop it. Or, your economy is like, we're, we're going to stop investing in your economy, basically. And so he came back and said, we're going to do it. And, and the only way to do that is really painful. If inflation starts to get away from you, it's really, really, pain. that's one of the things I teach in, in my principal's class, right? Once it gets away from you, it is really, really painful to stop. Um, and we're already doing enough pain right now to self-inflict another future pain. Uh, and so we, it has to be done very carefully. Is what I will say there. When it pertains to COVID's impact on the U.S. economy, what parallels do you see with how COVID has impacted the economy and what the U.S. was going through in 2008 during the recession that we had during that time? What parallels do you see and did you expect something like this to happen so quickly, especially in 2020? So obviously the, the, the pandemic was a shock and there, there are some, I mean, there are some similarities in the fact that we slid into a recession um and some things at the early stages they're they're fairly different right um now it's unclear whether or not they're going to be fairly so one of the things that happened in in 2008-9 right was that the housing market was out of whack yeah. um people owed a lot on houses the, there was the idea that it didn't really matter how much money you borrowed to have and i'm you know I, this is like a really crash course in this, right? So it gets really technical, but really crash course in this. There was the idea that um, it didn't really matter how much I spent on a house because in a year I could flip it and sell it. And so I would, I knew I could get my money back, right? Like the, the house price would go up by like a percent a year or, or something. And I would, I would be able to just sell it if I got, if I got in trouble and everything would be fine. And then people started doing that. And then it, kind of became realized that the, the only people that were like flipping the houses were people that were expecting to flip the houses. Right. And so like people don't actually want to live in a $1.5 million home on a small budget. Right. So they, so it turned out that once people started to realize maybe this isn't sustainable, all it, all it kind of took for that to unravel was for the first round of people to say, no, I'm not going to buy your house. And then there was no one to flip it to. Um, and then what happens is you're in massive debt. You've, you've overvalued your house because your house is really only valued at what you can sell it for. And if people are turning you down, then that's not the value of your house anymore. Right. And so then I can't sell it, but I also can't make the mortgage payments and it becomes a debt crisis and the financial system had tied itself heavily to the, to the debt crisis. The pandemic was a little different because it, it actually became in some sense a supply side issue, right? It wasn't that people didn't want to buy stuff. It's that people didn't want to go to work. Right. Um, right. Like it's like the people that, that were, you know, like, and, and they either didn't want to go to work or they were told they couldn't go to work. Right. So a combination of both of those things. But like, when you think about like the toilet paper crisis of 2020, right. It wasn't that people didn't want to buy the toilet paper right? Like they did. It was that they were buying a whole lot of it, but the supply side of it wasn't able to keep up um, in part because, well, in part because, right, when everyone went home, right, like the, the toilet paper that typically goes to office buildings wasn't the desired thing. Right. And, and so there just wasn't enough, there wasn't enough supply available to make the conversion and the switch. Um, and then you get, you know, people in the toilet paper factories or, or delivery trucks and things like they, they don't go to work and they don't, they get sick or they don't come. Um, and so it becomes sort of a, a supply issue. And so it's a little bit of a different effect when it comes through. And so you get a weirder kind of angle, right? Typically what we see is in a recession is that prices fall, but in some of those things, right, prices actually increased. Mm -hmm. And so you get a, a very different effect if it's a supply side issue versus a demand side issue. Right. When people aren't buying it, d demand falls and prices fall and we get deflation. Um, 
and then that freaks people out and it unravels. And this one, what we saw was at least in some areas, right? Not everything was the same, but in some areas you actually see an increase in prices that price people out uh, and, and it takes a long time. And then, and then even though the price is telling everyone go make more of this thing, it, it's, it takes too long to convert right? right. And, 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 and stuff. And so it's a little bit of a different crisis one of the concerns, or at least my concerns, other economists might feel differently about this, but one of my concerns is now that we're seeing the spiking unemployment and, and the jobs lost and things, is that we might develop more of that debt crisis, right? Which is now people aren't able to pay their rent and that rent is what the people, the landlords are using to pay their mortgages uh, and so now, now we're back in a similar situation. Now, now it looks, it might start to look more like 2007 and 2008 in terms of the causality of what's happening, right? Because now we're getting to the point where people are going to have been unemployed and now they're defaulting on their credit cards and they're defaulting on their, their mortgages or they're defaulting on their rents. And now we might start seeing some of those defaults that if the economy had bounced back really quickly. So if, if the virus had one of the original projections or at least hopes, right, was the summer was gonna kill out the virus and we wouldn't have to worry about it again until flu season. Right. Um, if that had happened, then maybe we would have seen a really sharp increase in this as people stayed home. And then as the virus dissipated over the summer, we, we would have bounced back really quickly. Mm -hmm. But now that it's lingered and it didn't really disappear in the way that people were hoping, um, we might now start to see some of those debt debt crunches begin to become a reality for people. And then that gets us back more into that. Maybe we'll start seeing it look more like the 2007 to 2009, which has pros and cons, right? A lot of the things that the Federal Reserve and, and stimulus monies are to do are for that kind of crisis. They actually did like this, like the stimulus package didn't stimulate anything during, during the COVID, the, the, the March, April COVID spike, because it wasn't that people didn't have money. It mm -hmm. was that they weren't willing to do anything. Uh, so giving, giving them like 1200 bucks didn't like make them then run to Walmart and buy stuff. Right. Um, whereas if it's now a debt crisis, maybe, maybe that the, the, the typical policies we see might have a little bit more of an effect, right? Again, there's risks associated with those policies, right? Like again, the debt problem, the inflation problem, but it might put them back into realms of things that we've seen before in modern times. I mean, like our last pandemic, we had some in the fifties and things, but the last one of this kind of magnitude, right. was like eight, 1918. Right. So, um, and so we didn't, you know, the, the fed, the fed was there, but it wasn't doing a whole lot. in at that period. So, mm -hmm. so now maybe we get back to where we, we have, we have some of our, maybe our tools start to make sense again for what we have to work with. Again, that's a possible, not a guarantee because the virus is, and the virus and the things that we've done around the virus, we've, we've set a lot of new precedents. Um, and, and the virus itself has set a lot of new precedents for the people's behavior. Um, and so it might take a long time to get back comfort to that comfort level. One of the things I also wanted to ask you is during this time, how individuals and especially college students can spend, uh, save, spend, and use their money wisely and effectively during this time. Um, I remember in high school, uh, I took a personal finance course and they showed videos of Dave Ramsey um, telling young students, high school and college, the fundamentals of saving up a $500 emergency fund, um, paying cash for your car, don't lease your car, just real basic fundamentals that hopefully people can use to stretch their money longer. Um, what tips or things have you learned along the way that you could potentially pass on to college students on how to spend and save effectively during a crisis like this? Um, the, the having a rainy day fund is, is really good. Part, part of the issue with that, right, is, it, is it's raining now. Yeah. So if you didn't save it up beforehand, it, it stings now in terms of that. Um, to tow, to, to tow the party line, stay in college. Um, so, and there's, there's, there's something to be said for that, right? Is, is that basically what happens is, is during recessions, right? Like it, it, your trade off is typically have a job or go to college. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a really bad economic situation, like we are now, right? You, you, if there's not a job available for you, at least you're doing college. Right. 
Um, and so that, like I said that facetiously, but there's actually some, some truth to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing is what we, what we know is graduate, especially if you're like a senior and you're finishing up, it's, it's not a great job market currently, um, de depending on your area, right? Again, some areas from this have like taken off, right? Like I, I can't imagine how much additional capacity Zoom has had to hire to, to like right. do all the things Zoom is doing now. Um, and so like some of those fields uh, to, to think about, right, is, is what kind of jobs are there that can, can work remotely, especially if we don't know if the virus is going to spike again and, and not, right? Is if you're thinking about jobs, thinking about which jobs can be done remotely and, and college can help with that, but also just in terms of like internships and when you're looking at what kind of internships to do, right, jobs that can be converted quickly to remotely. Um, if you're thinking about part-time jobs, the same kind of thing. Um, so there's there's those kinds of tips and, and college allows people to be like you weather recessions better because the type of work that you can do is is better, right? Mm -hmm. Like for, for for recession proof, right? The, not, right? When I say better, that's what I mean, not not as a normative statement, but like in a recession, the types of the, the, it's less manual labor. Manual labor is one of those right again m many college students are, are waiters and waitresses that's not great right now even at 25 percent capacity right that's not great right now um lots of my students last semester like i got notices being like you know i'm gonna miss class today because when i got sent home i had to pick up a job you know because my parents are in a, having trouble so I picked up a job to kind of help out and now I'm working for DoorDash or Uber Eats or, or something, right? And for younger people, depending on your risk profile, right? For younger people who at least seemingly are less at risk of really negative effects of the virus, not to, and, and you know, then again, doing protective face coverings, doing only, you know, touchless deliveries and things like that, right? But, but if, again, according to your risk profile, but a lot of students made money doing that. And people seem to be tipping fairly well, right, on trying to help out local businesses and things like that. Again, not everybody, you're going to get some crappy tips. <laughs> but, um, but those kinds of, those, there were some opportunities for that, for people who were mobile and could get out there and, and, and do deliveries. Um, and, Amazon picked up a lot of people to to do the capacity and I don't know what their ratio of part-time to full-time jobs are but college students who can pick up some Amazon either delivery boxing or 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 some of that right so you can um, I know they're building out some more capacities uh, many of our students are from the Northern Virginia area right they're building out their their capacity there for some stuff um, I don't think our mall is going to be one of those, but I saw where a company had bought out um, a lot of the, J the, the defunct JC Penney's and they were putting like Amazon fulfillment centers in the JC Penney's um, and, and malls. I don't think that company is the one that owns out uh, the, the one at New, New River Mall, but, um, but maybe that'll be a trend that catches on and then picking up work to, to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then if you are thinking manual labor, right, outdoor work, right, out, out, I mean, um, I come from a background of land surveying, and they, they were able to keep surveying because it's outdoor, you're away, you're socially distant, right, lawn care, you can still do because you're not going to actually have to interact with the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can, so basically think about jobs if you're, if you're looking for extra cash, right, uh, hopefully you had the savings plan from, right, save that $500, you, you want to try to keep Generally, you want to try to keep a couple of months. Like the, the rule of thumb is like you want three months of your rent and car payments and stuff saved up. Right? Yeah. Um, that's not always feasible for students, <laughs> um, but that's kind of the, the rule of thumb is try to keep three months of that going. But if, if you don't have that, right, picking up some of these, these part-time jobs and just thinking about, uh, so I actually was looking at some of DoorDash's stuff. I mean, they, their market share they took over an extra 10% of the market share, like from April to now. Um, they are expected to increase like two billion from in their in their market and their evaluation of their company. So companies that are doing delivery services are growing, they're expanding, they're getting a whole lot of money and investment coming in. 
and they're going to be looking to hire in some capacity. Um, and and that's, that might be good both for college students now who might be able to pick up the part-time work, but also if you're looking towards graduation to say, you really need a marketing person for your new thing, right? Like I got a marketing degree now, so maybe I could start struck looking for my job offers according to who I think has weathered this the best because they're going to be the ones more likely to be hiring. Right. Um, and so thinking about how to position yourself now for those jobs, it, you know, maybe, maybe doing the intern work or, or just kind of preparing my resume for, to sell myself to those kinds of companies. Um, maybe I pick up an odd job as like a, like a, a minor recruiter position for some company that I can work remotely with. Mm -hmm. um, some stuff like that that just gets me some stuff on my resume um, and, and money, right? It gets me both money now and something for my resume for the future. Um, but I think those are, those are kind of the tips. I mean, there's just so much uncertainty out there. Um, but thinking about what, what looks like it's going to be stable and, and we don't know what the next few years are going to hold. Um, and so obviously what I'd love to happen is that we get a working vaccine you know, tomorrow. <laughs> but even if we get a working vaccine, say, you know, March of next year, hopefully it's way faster than that, but March of next year, we don't know. They're, they're still kind of learning stuff about the virus to know whether or not this will become a seasonal thing. And so, so especially if you're risk averse or you're immunocompromised or whatever, at least for the next little bit while that, while that gets sorted, um, positioning yourself for that, for those jobs that let you be in an office setting that can scatter during an emergency situation and then come back afterwards, right? The ability to, to, to work remotely, get, get accustomed to technology. I think a lot of the technologies, there were lots of companies, universities that were very opposed to like you had, you had certain members of teams that were really opposed to integrating with technologies. They didn't have a choice now. Um, and so now they've converted to a lot of technologies. I think those technologies are, people are going to find that a lot of them are probably going to be here to stay because they help you connect really well, right? <laughs> like I, I got, I did not use Microsoft Teams before this happened, but now I do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of companies are going to be moving and, and learning those. So learn those things about how you connect and one Companies will be doing that, but also it opens up a whole new world in the way that many companies, their headquarters somewhere, but their work staff is everywhere. Right. Right. So that'll help you be able to grab those jobs and, and, and position yourself to say, look, I, I know how to do all of these technologies because, you know, even though I couldn't work, if, if you can't find a job, even though I couldn't work during school because there weren't that many jobs available to me in the area that I was in. What I did during my free time was I learned all of these different software programs. Um, and then at least you can say, look, I couldn't get paid for it, but I learned all of these for free. So just imagine what I'll do for your company when you're actually paying me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's about positioning yourself in those kinds of ways for the, for the future. Um, and, and even though we're at times are tough now and it's super stressful, um, I would take care of yourself now, right? And I'm, adding, I'm adding things for what you're comfortable with, but there's also not a lot of shame in just being like, things are super freaking overwhelming right now. And some of my downtime, I'm going to play some Xbox to maintain my sanity. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's no shame in that, right? Like you'd rather do that than over, than to basically burn yourself out before you even get to the, to the big leagues, right? Like, mm -hmm. Um, and so, so you want to, you want to kind of strategize that, but if you feel comfortable, right, these are the kind of things that you can try to do to just position yourself for the future. If today doesn't look so good. And during this time of uncertainty, what are some things that have kept you motivated or optimistic for the future? How do you keep yourself in a positive, how do you have a positive attitude during this time? And what do you look forward to, to accomplishing this semester and throughout your career in the future? I have a couple of dogs and they're both on special diets and their food's really expensive. So I really am motivated to keep working. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, really, I mean, I, I've taken some time for some downtime. Um, 
and you know I, I do the xbox thing right like there's a certain time in the evening when i'm just like nope i'm gonna shut down i'm not gonna do anything academically i'm gonna watch some cartoons or something where my head i can just shut my head down for a little bit mm-hmm. right and so i've got i've got that and maintaining friendships i mean zoom zoom has been one their zoom fatigue is a real thing right i mean people get tired of being on zoom all the time um, but we we kept some like happy hour groups going where we just sit around and chat. Um, I recommend doing that with friends just to, even if you're not seeing each other, um, like if you haven't seen anyone for a really long time, just have a Zoom chat with them. Um, it helps kind of keep you refreshed. Um, finding a big yard where you can all sit socially distance is, is for us, we found that to be, you know, we, we, we could hang out and then actually see each other face to face far apart right i mean but at least then like it's human contact and in, in person yeah um uh doing that kind of stuff um but but basically just just seeing how even when times have been pretty crappy in the over the last year um a lot of people have pulled together to to try to overcome right like again like seeing the downtown radford area not collapse from this and the and people being willing to like continue going and spending their money to keep it flowing, even even though their times are tough too, right? Like going right. and keeping it keeping it flowing, and just seeing how people are, are willing to do that for each other has been has been good. Seeing seeing our teams here, um, and again, we don't know what it's going to look like and whether or not this is going to be sustainable. We're all hoping it is, but like they outfitted all of the classrooms to be Zoom capable, and they did that in like a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, that they worked their asses off for that, <laughs> um, uh, and it, it's not flawless, right? Like we find some hitches up here and there, but but like they they really went to bat for that. So so saying the fact that people are, are are really just working hard to make to try to get everything to to be as normal as you can make it in a time like this uh, has been, has been pretty good. And I've enjoyed being back in a classroom and seeing my, my students again. Like I, 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 that is my preferred method of teaching is just teaching the classroom where we can chat and talk and, and it's more organic that way. Yeah. Um, and so I, 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 I've seen that, but, but basically the connection with, with friends and the remembers to, to be, to, to take some time for yourself. And I know that this all sounds like a platitude, but like, one of the things I realized over the last few months is that that's, it's not a platitude, right? Like take, take some time for yourself and, and just, um, I, I like put an app on my phone for meditation, super cheesy, never something I thought about doing, Mm -hmm. but then it's like, here's like a 10 minute, you know, meditation session. And I'm like, you know, that it actually did lower my stress levels, uh, stuff like that. And just thinking outside the box on some of that to, to, to try some things that you never tried before, just, to see if it helps um and certainly reaching out to, to friends and family i i have made a lot more phone calls to home and to people around to to stop just to be in contact because i mean god forbid anything happened to them in this scenario right at least i've talked with them in the last week <laughs> um so that kind of stuff um and then just you know i mean as as a professor here at Radford, you know, we, we got to keep teaching last spring. So we got to keep our paychecks going. Right. That wasn't true of a lot of other people. And so I, I keep that thought in my head, right? How lucky we were for that, because that wasn't true of a lot of people. Um, and so I keep that thought just saying, you know, even when things might be kind of bad, there are some people that have it a lot worse and, and we do what we can to help them, right? But But basically don't take for granted the fact that this is what I get to do every day, right? Like I, I, I get to teach and some, I get to basically talk and people have to listen to me and I get paid for that. Uh, so like, that's, that's like a really good gig, right? So that, that keeps me, you know, that keeps my spirits, you know, higher than they could be. Well, Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with the target and for having this open discussion. The paper really appreciates it. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Um, so thanks for having having this conversation with me. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good day. You too.